So I've got this awesome NVIDIA RTX A6000. This is a GPU that has 48 gigabytes of RAM. Thank you, NVIDIA. We're, let's do something really cool with it. Let's generate a 32K. You heard me right, not an 8K, not a 4K, not even a 16K, but a 32K image with it or even video, the same code works just fine for that, of a Mandelbrot. I like Mandelbrot because it works quite well with the GPU. It's all linear algebra and it's a very, very simple equation. It's, and the code to produce this is quite short, but it runs on this technology on the GPU using complex numbers really, really fast. And it's also a high precision operation because as you zoom in on the Mandelbrot, like, like is very common in a lot of videos exploring it, you need extremely precise numbers. So we'll also take a look at 64-bit floating points and see, see what that looks like. We'll essentially have a 128-bit complex number loaded on the GPU and lots and lots of pixels. So here is the code necessary for this. And this is what I really like about the Mandelbrot set. It's really very simple when you get right down to it. There's the code to actually render it. This has all of the nice colorations that you typically see in a Mandelbrot. I did not invent this particular way of coloring it. It's kind of a blue color. You'll see all kinds of different ways to color Mandelbrots. This part alone can get really complex. The part that we're really dealing with here, though, is actually plotting the Mandelbrot. And essentially, what you can think of a Mandelbrot is a two-dimensional plane, just like a computer screen, that has a bunch of pixels. Each of those pixels has a coordinate, but it's not the coordinate on your screen. It's on a Cartesian plane. X is essentially the real numbers and y is essentially the imaginary numbers. So, so together they become complex numbers. You don't even have to really think of the complex numbers. Just think of it as x and y. So let's look at how to actually call it first before we actually look at how to implement it. This is the function that I wrote up there. It accepts several render sizes. This is the size of the image that you're going to actually create. I have 32K, that's about the biggest size that I can generate. I don't have a 32K monitor, I have a 4K. That's as high as I go that I can actually see it. Depending on which article you read, the human eye, some claim it does not do much more than 4K. I don't tend to believe that, but because I've seen 4K and 8K next to each other. Some claim that around 32K is the top, so who knows, I'm not a biologist or an optometrist, so I don't know the logical extent of that. Recording at this does have its uses, and I'll show you that in a moment. The render size that I chose here is just HD for the notebook. Generating this massive thing into the notebook doesn't do a lot for you. Then there's a center. The, the origin is actually right around here, I believe. You typically shift it a little bit, otherwise this part will get cut off of the classic Mandelbrot. And the reason you saw that sine and cosine up in the render is just so that we can cycle through the colors a bunch of times. Otherwise, it would just be a gradient. It would be blue all the way out to black and just once. And you can zoom in on this thing infinitely. So the colors have got to cycle. Otherwise, you're not going to get much coloration. Zoom is how far you're zoomed in. You can really zoom in almost infinitely on this. And this is why you need the 64-bit floats and not the 32-bit. I'll show you what happens when you do 32-bit in a moment. It's, it's kind of disturbing. The cycles. You can think of the cycles as almost the quality of it, but we'll see mathematically exactly what a cycle is in a moment. 200 gives you a pretty good thing. I've done even 2,000 or 20,000. This is where the GPU rocks. Plotting this kind of thing on the CPU, pop this into CoLab and try it with and without, and you'll see what I mean. It's an order of magnitude faster on the GPU. And then when you run it, you're seeing this. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few examples. 
Let's look at what it looks like when we render one at 32K. So I'm basically going to render this to a test PNG file. Let me pop that open in Photoshop so you can see it here. You'll want to be careful of the image editor that you use for this kind of thing. If we look at the canvas size, you can see this thing is gigantic. Where this is neat is I can have this large image and I can zoom in on it. And I can keep zooming in further and further and further. And it's all pre-rendered because it's this is all just in Photoshop. Now we'll eventually reach the limit. See there, there we're down to the pixel. So even a 32K image, when you're dealing with something like Mandelbrot, is not that big. This shows how you can render one of those zoom videos that, that they do of Mandelbrot. And if you want to start experimenting with zooming your own Mandelbrots, this code is actually a, a great starting point because you can basically just modify it and that rendering area is where you're going to really express your creativity. But this is all I'm really doing. I am going to render through 3000 images and I am going to plot it over and over and over again. I rendered it at HD because that's the clip that I'm going to throw into here and show you in a second. And then this is the starting point. Now I had to search around and find, I wanted a good starting point that if you zoom in on it, you're not just going to zoom into black because in some of these, there's YouTube videos that do an hour zoom on this. I can't imagine the precision that they were getting into on calculating the numbers for these. This point lasts pretty long. Eventually it diverges off into blackness. And then the zoom, I'm just gradually decreasing the zoom. I start out at one and I just gradually, gradually zoom in 99% each of the way through that. I save all the individual frames and then I'm going to use FFmpeg to put it together. Then when you run it, it looks like this. You can see this awesome zoom as I am going deeper and deeper and deeper into the Mandelbrot. This is not a particularly long zoom compared to some of those that they render on the internet. But if you wanted to go further, you could certainly do that. You would just adjust that 3000 value that I had in there and, and go deeper. The trick with going deeper though, is you're gonna converge into the, into the black zone and not get any more images because you're not gonna find some hidden piece of Mandelbrot out in the, the black area of, of the image. So let's go up to the function here. All of this right here is all that you need to generate a Mandelbrot. So what this is doing is I've got to get it to a Cartesian plane. So I need the X's and the Y's. Now this thing is centered at zero. So it's not like a computer screen where zero, zero is the upper corner. It's, it's a Cartesian plane. I'm going to need to go negative and positive on the X axis. The X axis is the real numbers if you're dealing in complex numbers. And then the Y axis is the imaginary numbers up and down all centered at zero. So what I'm going to do is be passed in the render size, the point that it's centered on, so the point that would be in the middle of my render. Zero, zero is, is common, but you change that because you want to zoom in on an interesting part of it, not the middle of it. Zero, zero is black on this render, and that's not going to give you much information. And then zoom takes you closer and closer in, and then cycles, we'll get that to a a minute, that's essentially the quality. So the first thing we're going to do is divide zoom by the render size in X. So F is essentially the pixel size. This is the mapping between the pixels on that Cartesian plane, which can be infinitely small. So it's not like a pixel on a computer screen, which is just a fixed size, but we pick a size on the Cartesian plane of the Mandelbrot. And we we essentially, that's the smallest unit that we're putting onto the map. Now, when we zoom in even further, that, that breaks up as well. So F, and it's square. We're not mapping rectangular, non-square pixels here. We have to calculate the real start, the real end, the imaginary start, and the imaginary end. So this is on the coordinates of the Cartesian plane that is used to map it. So you've real, that's X. So real start, that's the start in X and the start in Y. 
That's going to be centered about the, the center pixel that you have, the center that you're passing in. And in imaginary, that's up and down. And all I'm doing here is basically just taking the render size divided by two, since we have the center point, and scaling them all by the F, which is the size of our pixel in the Mandelbrot world. And then I set up ranges. This is the range between the real and the imaginary, the X and the Y. Notice I'm using float 64. And this is interesting because in neural networks, you don't, you just don't need 64-bit precision because for one thing, the optimization algorithms are going to optimize out the imprecision just, just like anything else. In Mandelbrot, that'll kill you. So if I change these to 32 and I render a video, take a look at this. Now I'll warn you, this, this might be one of those seizure type videos because it gets a bit shaky. So it's, it reminds me of Blair Witch Project a little bit if you've ever seen that. It, but it's kind of like watching a spaceship crash. So here it, here it runs. And this, you can see, it's, it's like watching a crash. It gets closer, 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 starts to get shaky, and then boom, lines. It's, it's done. You've got to have 64-bit to get that fluid motion that I was showing you earlier. So these are two ranges. Those are essentially your two axes. You've got the, the, the real and the imaginary. Then you have this mesh grid. And notice I'm doing this all in the GPU because I'm using TensorFlow to do this. By the way, would you like to see the same thing done in PyTorch? It would not be that, that different. Or would you like to see it done in native CUDA? I could certainly do that as well. That would be below even PyTorch and Cura's itself. So mesh grid, what this is doing is it's taking those two axes and it's creating, think of it like a checkerboard with grids. You're giving it a step value which is the which is the f so you're you're stepping through each of those and you're stepping through the other axis and together that's a checkerboard and each point on that checkerboard is a coordinate essentially an x and a y over a real and imaginary part that's why it looks like a complex number so this mesh grid is a grid of it's really 3d two by two, and then each one has has its own dimension as well. We get a grid constant. The grid constant, that is the, the, the same value that this mesh grid really even started at. And notice we are converting it to a complex number. So we've got the, we, we keep a constant of it just where it started, and then we keep the current values that are going to change. Initially, these two are the same, but we're going to modify them as we go. And then counts becomes very important because we're going to essentially run the same equation over and over and over again on the same number and see if, see if the number stays in a nice orbit. Think of something like a sine or a cosine. It's just, it's just going up and it's not converging out to infinity. We keep the count of how long these have not just shot off to infinity. And that's really what you're looking at on a Mandelbrot, is just how many iterations can you get through a very simple equation before the resulting value that keeps getting fed back into that same equation just converges off into infinity. And how many counts that is what is determining your pixel colors. Mandelbrot Helper is where all that magic actually happens. So Mandelbrot Helper, I separated this off as a separate function because you might want to make it a TF function. I didn't find enough complexity in here that that was particularly helping me to run faster, so I, I don't have the TF function enabled here. We're gonna loop for the number of cycles. So this loop is fixed. And we're going to create a temporary variable. Now this is a, a matrix of complex numbers. And this is this function that you see right here, this equation is the heart of the Mandelbrot process. We're taking the current value squared, so multiplied it by itself, added to the starting value, that constant that we had. 
We're just constantly looping through this for all of the cycles. So we keep taking the current values and squaring them. Normally, if you square something, it goes up, 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 up. But because these are fractional values, it's not necessarily just shooting off to infinity. They, they tend to orbit in a lot of cases. And the ones, the, the pixels that form the tight orbits and don't go off to infinity, those are the values that are black in the rendering of the Mandelbrot that we're going to see in a moment. So diverge means that it's shot off to infinity. To tell that, we're going to take the absolute value of this, this complex, complex meaning using, using complex numbers, not complex as in complicated. This is actually a very simple equation. So long as it's not greater than four, because this is a this is the Cartesian plane, we're just basically drawing a four rectangle around it. And if you look at if you look at the non zoomed in Mandelbrot, it's it's like drawing a box around it. And that's essentially the the four that you have there. So if for each of these pixels, we're looking at, as we do that square over and over and over again for the complex numbers, does it just sort of orbit? If it just orbits, it's black. If it shoots off to infinity, then it's going to have one of these colors. And how long it takes it to shoot off to infinity, that's where the color comes from. There's also other values that you can deal with in Mandelbrot's like how tight is the orbit there's there's a lot of information that the more colorful complex plots make use of that in this simple example I'm basically throwing away and then we take the values that we have calculated from from temp and we just assign it back into current values and that's that loop that you have going on where you're constantly multiplying them if you want to see some good visuals of how Mandelbrot is actually calculated you can definitely see those on a lot of different videos that they have on YouTube for these. The point of this video is we're loading this all into this gigantic GPU that NVIDIA was kind enough to give to me and showing that we can really render a very high resolution. Even the high res zoom that I show you here did not take, because it's at 4K, did not take all that much time really to render. Thank you for watching this video, and if you're interested in artificial intelligence, rendering, and all these kind of things, please subscribe to my channel, and please give the video a like. Thank you very much.